everyone. Um, this is Titanic Reflections. Welcome to Deep Conversations, Episode 3. Um, I'm Joanna Dolan, and tonight we're joined by Kipper Fox, also of RMS Titanic Reflections, and he's also the founder of Fox Star Line. Um, Eric Farley is also one of the admin team members for RMS Titanic Reflections, and we are honored to be joined um, by special guest Bill Sauter. Um, <clears throat> he is with us tonight on the 100th uh, anniversary of Titanic sinking, and we really appreciate all of you for joining us as well. Um, tonight we'll be reflecting on Titanic's um, artifacts. Uh, many of you, uh, just like myself, probably saw Titanic's artifacts for the first time as they lay in the debris field uh, two and a half miles under the uh, surface of the ocean. Um, probably in a book very much like this one, uh, thanks to Dr. Robert Ballard. Um, and if you're like me, I saw kind of a funny Facebook post um, earlier today. So uh, your book might be signed just like mine is. I think that uh, Dr. Ballard signed pretty much all of them. It's in here somewhere. But anyway, so thanks to Dr. Ballard for uh, first introducing us to Titanic's artifacts. Um, in uh, 1985 uh, when the wreck was discovered and then again uh, when he went back in 1986 for um, a more in-depth look at them um, and the wreck. Um, then a man named George Tullock came along, um, I believe it was 1987 uh, when he began salvaging um, some of the artifacts from the wreck of the Titanic. Um, I believe his heart was in the right place, he just wanted to share Titanic with the world and um, thanks to him, um, millions of people all over the world have seen, um, you know, up close and personal, um, the personal effects um, of the people who traveled on Titanic um, and uh, the people who, who had these things, they're remembered um, because of George Tullock. Um, he founded a company called RMS Titanic Inc. Um, it's still in existence today. Um, Bill Sauter um, was once affiliated with RMSTI. And just to clarify that um, due to some non-disclosure agreements, um, he will um, not answer any questions tonight that are directly related to the company. Um, however, he has brought along a very um, special presentation related to the artifacts that he would like to share with us. Um, He'll take some questions um, uh, throughout the, um, the presentation um, as he comes into little breaks. So if you have any questions for Bill Sauter, please uh, leave those in the comments section and we'll be uh, glad to get those ready for him. Um, so at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Bill. Bill, thank you again for being with us tonight. Hi, um, Joanna, thanks very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I just want to let the audience know that um, I was with uh, RMST for about 22 years. Um, I went out to Titanic in the year 2000, and RMST seemed to like the way so I was brought back as a consultant and then a full-time employee. Uh, for most of that time, I dealt with the artifacts. I was not the curator. I was not the conservator but I was sort of an advisor. Uh, I did the research on what various objects were. Uh, I got to examine just about everything in the collection. That was fascinating. Uh, the presentation I'm going to show tonight is an overview of a few things that I think are interesting, possibly interesting to the general public. There's about four or five sections. Uh, we'll be looking at the China, the silverware, some of the navigational items, personal items, and a few curiosities. Um, it's divided up into segments. And rather than have the audience hold a question about a first object for maybe 45 minutes, at the end of each segment, I'll be calling for questions about the China or the silver, whatever has been discussed most recently. Um, if there's no comments, let's just get right into it. Thank you, Bill. That sounds great. <laughs> okay. 
The first segment is uh, the China. Titanic is a particularly general, and that's a funny thing to say to uh, an abandoned piece of machinery, but the thing is most wrecks sink whole. And as a consequence, you really have to dig in and get drag, drag things out of the Hulk. Uh, and that sort of skews the sort of things you're looking at. Titanic broke open like an egg and just about everything from the center section fell out into the sand. Uh, here's a drawing of the quote missing third section and that mostly makes up the debris field. You'll notice that the, the missing third section goes through virtually every kitchen and pantry on board the ship. And this is important because what happens is it means that whatever we find or whatever we, we recover uh, is statistically significant because all the first class China, all the second class China, all the third class China, it's down there. And so you wind up with a statistically significant uh, recovery profile. You aren't favoring one thing over another. I'm kind of mentioning this now because at the end, we're going to talk about the significance of recovery and how it really helps fill out our understanding of uh, the Titanic wreck site. The first objects up to bat are the third class dishware. Uh, the reason why we're going with that first is because these are probably the most elementary China used on board. And they sort of explain uh, the more evolved second and first class, which will come later. Um, I should probably mention that it's not really China. This is called earthenware. It's a very cheap form of dishware. What it's of is clay that's been fired, but not to the point where it stops being clay and it starts being glass-like, vitreous, China. Uh, so if you chip it, the inside actually looks like clay. Uh, here's a sample of pieces actually brought up from the wreck. You'll notice that the body forms are very simple. And they're almost completely without ornamentation. The only thing you see on these is a property mark, and this is to prevent pilferage. It you can see of this maroon white star line, uh, which is under a single layer of glaze. The reason why I mention this is out of all the thousands of pieces of China on board, only the third class ones really have come up uh, intact. Occasionally you find things that the uh, purpose is not exactly obvious. This is a small covered dish. Um, it's known from photographs, the salt cellar. This is the third class dining room. And you'll notice there's an orange triangle on the left. You have uh, the salt cellar, which is an open, um, an open bowl of salt for table use. And then immediately to the right, you see a pepper shaker. The fact that it has a lid suggests that this has been used also for a jam jar or a jelly jar. In other words, one piece of uh, China is, is serving very, is fun. you can see why space is limited on a ship. And quite frankly, dining in third class is very informal. So you don't have this over, speci over specialization that you would see in first class. Here's a couple of other pieces. I wanted to draw your attention to what we today would call a mug. Um, when you're doing China assessment, what is it? It's important not to bring your little modern prejudices to the subject because you would glance at that and you would say, well, it's obviously a coffee mug. Unfortunately, that's not how they drank coffee in England in 1912. Uh, this would have been called tankard, 
and it's probably for broths rather than coffee itself. It's also a good idea to keep track of what other wrecks, especially White Star wrecks, are bringing up. This piece, this cylindrical bowl or conical bowl, is not uh, from Titanic. It's actually from the RMS Arabic. Um, these photos are in my collection because you see stuff like this in the debris field. And without some sort of reference, you know, it's just a mostly white object, but if you have a sense of scale, you might be able to assign, aha, this is a porringer. Uh, this little bowl would have been used for uh, oatmeal, gruel, grits, any of the porridgey um, foods that were eaten in third class at the time. Also, occasionally, you see uh, things that have no markings whatsoever. There's no maker's mark. There's no ownership. This presents a problem because you're trying to determine whether this is a third class piece or this is possibly a um, something that passengers are bringing with them. A lot of second and third class, especially if they're emigrating, uh, brought as much stuff as they would need as they could reasonably carry to establish a new household rather than go through the trouble of buying everything fresh. Uh, photographs frequently come to the rescue. Here you see essentially the same picture in some very low resolution photographs of the class. Now you'll notice that the profile does not quite match. Notice that this is more snub nosed at the picture, at the pore, and this is a, a much harder beak like. That's because. Um, these lower grade china sets are not critical. They're really, they tend to be made by various manufacturers working out of slightly different molds. And that's the end of third class. Any questions on this stuff? I think we're good so far, Bill. I'm seeing a lot of people um, that are watching and everybody is saying hello. I think everybody's enjoying um, the presentation so far. I have not seen any specific questions though yet. Okay, well, if something occurs to anybody, painful. just ship it through. There's always time for an another question. Okay, definitely. This is fascinating. Now in second class, you can see we've moved up a step. Uh, this material is still earthenware, but you'll notice that now it's actually decorated. Uh, this is just generically called a blue dinner. Uh, it was very popular in the 18th century, and the Victorians loved it. This stuff is all over Victorian wear, just like amoebas and atoms are all over mid-century stuff from the 1950s. Uh, most of these pieces you would look at and know what they were. Second class was a very uh, middle-class um, way to travel. And so there's nothing too fancy fancy like you'd find in France. Um, but occasionally there are things that throw you for a loop. Now the ruler down at the bottom is about six inches. So you can see this is not a very large piece, uh, but it threw people for a long time. On one hand, it has the classical shape of a spittoon. It isn't a spittoon because the neck isn't narrow enough. Some people have suggested that maybe it's a um, chamber pot, but a chamber pot has to be constructed heavily enough that you can sit on it and put your whole weight on uh, the ceramic. That's not possible with this. It's quite thin, about an eighth of an inch thick. Eventually, what it was became known by looking at other ships' photographs. This happens to be the second class dining room on the Empress of Ireland. And you'll notice um, there are several pots here and here holding palms. There's no hole in the bottom. So this is, is not a planter per se. I believe the correct term is cash pot. And what happens is you take the live plant, you put it in something serviceable like terracotta, 
And then you put that in this sleeve and it forms kind of an ornamental covering uh, that allows the plant to be taken out of service or rotated or changed at a moment's notice without having to disturb the dirt. It also acts as a catch for watering uh, in case you water, you don't have a bunch of spill all over the floor or all over the, uh, the seating arrangements. First class is an animal to itself. You can see that in the first class dining room, what we have is a complicated overlay of um, decal work. All this golden filigree is actually put on, on the decal like you would do that on a model. The, the pattern is printed, I guess it's on a piece of celluloid or rice paper or something that's horribly thin. And the paper sort of disappears and it leaves the, uh, the scroll work behind. And then that's fired. And then these turquoise tongues are painted in and the pennant on the flag is painted in and then that's fired. And then in the end, you put a gold it to show that it's first class service. Gold highlighting was very expensive. Um, the problem is it's not durable. The, the environment down at the Titanic is incredibly hostile. The, the mud, for instance, has the pH, the acidity of um, tomato juice. So it damages metals and finishes very, very easily. You can see that these two top pieces have altered in some way. The bottom pieces have probably been pulled straight out of the mud. As you look at these cups, by the way, you have to watch very carefully. Um, the two cups at the top, for instance, look like they're identical and they're not. If you look very carefully, you'll notice that the one on the right is slightly larger and it's slightly more globular. The one on the left has shoulder square. And the reason why I mention that is dishes in China were in first class were very fussy. Uh, you might have a cup that is specifically for drinking tea. And then you have a slightly larger cup that looks the same that is for cocoa. Then you might have another cup that's strictly for coffee. In Wherever possible, I like to go back to um, catalogs, the original manufacturer's catalogs. And Dan Klistener has been very, very helpful in providing that sort of stuff for the China and the Civil War. Unfortunately, the China in first class dining room is pretty hard to document. And in this case, what's happened is I've had to fall back on the China available for the Queen Mary because those catalogs do exist and it's very particular, they're very specific about what it is they are, whether they're for coffee or tea or demitasse. And by establishing what the uh, city in fluid ounces is, you can get an idea of what that might be. So all of these first class dining room cups they're tentatives. I think they're correct, but there's no way actually to know until the catalogs turn up. Here's a, a poor creamer that's been completely stripped of uh, all of its decorations. Same thing with an egg cup. This is an interesting dish. It's in the catalog as an hors d'oeuvre, and it could be used for hors d'oeuvres, and it is also probably used for sauces. First of all, you'll notice that there are three uh, scallop shaped wells. Um, very often, if you order a particular uh, course, you might have an option, an option about what sort of um, sauce you want the meat dressed with. 
So one of these compartments might have A's and the other might have Sospernays and the other might have Veluté and you would have the option of which one you were into. You'll notice there are tiny little divots in the partitions. That's where you rest the spoon. Here's one that's fully dressed in its original um, turquoise markings. When you look at this dish from the side, you'll notice there are thumb holes. Uh, so this suggests that this plate was actually meant to be carried and the contents offered to the passenger. And of course, the two things that come to mind are certain types of canapes and hors d'oeuvres, and then the sauces, which I just mentioned a moment ago. Unfortunately, just about all the first class pieces from the dining room have been damaged. You can see this is a, this is a vegetable dish. And here's a trick of the trade. When you come up to one of these heavily damaged pieces, don't look at it straight ahead. Look at it in a light bounce, like a mirror off the surface. And then when you do that, you'll be able to read what the original decoration was. Something that's been disappointing about uh, the Titanic China recovered is because the decor, the decorations have been so badly damaged, it doesn't help solve a couple of mysteries. For instance, before the Titanic was discovered, it was that there were two versions of this pattern, one in turquoise, which is quite common, and then one in brown, which is quite uncommon. The question is, why? Um, now, keep in mind that on the secondary market, which is what existed before Titanic was discovered, uh, all the China was scattered. You know, there might be personal stories, but you always have to wonder whether or not you could take those stories seriously. And there were questions. Was the turquoise from the North Atlantic and the brown might be from a different period, maybe from the 20s? Or maybe that was what they were using in the Australia service. Because generally speaking, the brighter the color, such as the turquoise, the more expensive uh, the application paint is. So theoretically, this stuff on the left would be cheaper than the blue stuff on the right. Now, as far as I remember, just one piece has come up from the Titanic with brown. That's excellent. That proves that these are contemporary and they're used in the same environment. Can't be used in the same room. To have a mismatch like this would just be in, in bad taste. Uh, so the question is, perhaps the brown is used for the cabin service and the turquoise is used for the dining room. Because keep in mind that if you're in your first class cabin, and you would like to have dinner served in, or you would like snack or tea or cookies, uh, that would have to be served on plates. And steamship companies pay very, very close attention to breakage. They're trying to control theft. They're trying to control carelessness. And you can see that they want to be sure that the dining room staff isn't being laid to blame because the cabin staff is making too much China and somebody else is going to pick up the bill. That may be what's going on here at the moment. I don't know. And here's a head to head on comparison of the two. Oddly, the main dining room plates have not been recovered. This is called the Gothic arch uh, pattern. Haven't found any, haven't seen any, don't know where they are, and nothing brought up that would suggest that this pattern was not used. In other words, no dinner plate covered to the best of my knowledge. Were there any questions up to here? 
Well, let's have a look at the a la carte china. Bill, we actually you to... have a couple of questions. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> um, that's okay. I was just kind of looking back. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Nicholas Thomas, um, I think I'm saying this right, grown. Um, were the pa patterns painted by hand on the yes. china? Yes, we're still, as a matter of fact, on fine china, this is still all done by hand. Wow. Uh, the dexterity of machinery has not reached a point where this can be done automatically. Now it can be printed, uh, and the printing has gotten quite good, but still hand painted china is the standard. Joanna, you've frozen. Sorry about that. My internet's kind of. I guess I have to take over because Joanna just froze. Uh -oh. um, Sorry about that. Um, I think we have another question in the chat or in the comment. Hey. Oh, she's back. Okay, never mind. So you go ahead. Go ahead, Kipper. You can get, do the next one. Okay. Um, where is it? Oh, uh, what was the time frame during the restoration of these pieces? Like, I guess in, in all? Yeah. Um, recovery operations started in 1987. And the conservation actually starts the moment these pieces come into the laboratory. Uh, China and earthenware are very sensitive to salt exfoliation. What happens is because this stuff is porous, it's been underwater for so long, salt invades the, uh, the clay. And, and if you don't treat it immediately, what happens is the salt dries out and forms crystals. And the crystals will break the uh, the china up into pieces and eventually powder. Um, what the conservators do is, is they put the china in a salt bath whose salinity matches the environment it was recovered from. And then very slowly, small amounts of this water is, are tapped off and fresh water is put in. And so over a period of time, and it might be a period of years, uh, the salt is leached out and the china is stabilized. And then, of course, this process is re repeated at the next uh, mission and then the mission after that. So it's like a conveyor belt process. Wow. I don't think people realize the ongoing process that restoration and preservation of these artifacts really is. I mean, it's something that, you know, it, it's just an ongoing process, you know, whether the artifacts are in a museum or whether they're in a warehouse, it's just, it's constant conservatorship. You know, they, they just constantly have to be taken care of. Constantly yeah, have to be yeah, by, by law. Right. Yeah, the court requires RMST to have a conservator and monitor these on a regular basis for denigration uh, because it sounds funny, but none of this stuff is actually gets fixed. It's always under observation and care. Uh, garments, paper, metal, china are particularly um, troubling because the paper and the, the cloth are so fragile. Uh, and in the case of metal, like the big piece, uh, steel also gets salt invasion. And there's constant watching because you get um, eruptions of corrosion every once in a while. You can see the steel start to bubble. And that's a bad sign. And of course, we have all kinds of
of metal objects. So they all need to be watched. That actually reminds me of Titanic's whistles. Um, they had to do a complete restoration of them before they could even sound them off. And if I remember correctly, they can't even sound them off today It'd be because they don't want to damage the whistle that, that's already been damaged after being underwater for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Uh... The, the whistle restorations were done before I was there, so I can't speak very directly to them. But we actually have two different types of whistle sets. The first set of whistles, the first type of whistles, are from the number one and the number two funnel, and they're made out of bronze. And then the other whistle type is either from the number three or the number four funnel. It's impossible to tell. Um, they're actually made of pot metal. I mean, in, in essence, they're not bronze. There's, I believe they're a, a nickel, not a nickel, um, a tin alloy. And of course their conservation is completely different. And by the way, they're not made anything like the regular whistles. They're strictly dummies, strictly dummies. That's interesting. So they were never made to to sound it off, to sound off at all, really? The, the no, second. no. They were purely visual dummies to uh, balance out the ship's profile. That's interesting. It's really like the fourth funnel. <laughs> I was just going to say that. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. Um, oh, where to go? From our friend Steve Hurst, um, back to the China. He said, was there a teapot? Uh, he said there was a teapot, wasn't it? I'm assuming he's referring to um, either the, probably the first class China. Was there a teapot that went with that or the second class China? You know, Joanna, you're breaking up. Can you hand that off to Kipfer? Yeah, Kip, take that one away. I, I couldn't hear any of that. Was there a teapot on... I can't find it. Am I back now? Yes. Okay. Um, our friend Steve Hurst wanted to know if there was a teapot. I'm assuming that went with either the first or the second class China. Yes. Um, the general rule of thumb is if it's something that you personally ate from or drank from, it's in China. If it is something that stays on the table, it's made silver. That's not true for all ships and that's not even completely true for Titanic, but that is the general rule of thumb. Uh, there is no coffee pot or teapot in the first class uh, dining room pattern. Okay. Um, pause again. I don't know what is wrong with my internet. Right. Um. Kiffer, can you take over as as host because Joanna's feed is just all messed up at my end. Sure. Um, Michael Standard has another question. Was the coffee even a big thing with the British? He said, tea, I know, but uh, but I had the impression that coffee was more of an American thing. In 1912, yeah, it still was an American thing, but the British were very interested in what was called Turkish coffee. American coffee is very similar to what you'd see today. And in essence, it's, it's percolator coffee. The British were interested in the coffee that was served in the Ottoman Empire, in which the coffee is served very hot and very strong. And the cup is called a demitasse. And it's almost the size of a large shot glass. Because the caffeine, the caffeine is so concentrated, you don't want to drink very much of it. So that was the um, that was the atmospherics on 
uh, coffee drinking on Titanic. As a matter of fact, almost all of these small uh, cylindrical cups that you see are for drinking Turkish coffee. That I didn't know. I thought it was mostly uh, the America that drank coffee. I didn't know that one. Yeah, it's uh, it's basically a stereotype. Um, I'll probably say it again. Anybody that's doing serious research on this goes in with a blank slate because otherwise you wind up with a bunch of, um, pardon me, but basically benign fairy tales about the British or about Europeans or about Victorians. And a lot of times it's really not true. Um, I actually got into a discussion today about the Turkish baths. Um, because we have this um, caricature of Victorians as being overly prudish about everything. And the quickly came down to the degree of nudity that would have been acceptable in the Turkish baths. Well, in 1912, most men had a very practical way to deal with nudity. You just ignored it because it was a major part of rural military life. And so many people lived in a rural environment or the military or in really unpleasant uh, urban factory environments. And you just muddled through it and there was no real crisis you know, that you were nude. Now, if there was a woman in the room, well, that would be completely different, naturally. What happened is, uh, as the 21st century has evolved, men have gotten very skittish about any sort of public nudity. And so we look back at how much was seen or unseen in a Turkish bath, and we just assume, well, they're just covered up to their necks. They weren't. They were very lightly clad. And to tell you the truth, a lot of men liked being able to get out of their clothes like that. So they might have a uh, oh, bathrobe on or a towel or nothing. And any of that would have been acceptable especially when they went in for a massage. So what I'm trying to say with all of this is um don't read secondary sources. Go back and read letters and diaries and look at photographs of people in the period and you'll get a much better idea of what these people were about as a culture and as individuals. I'll have to remember that one. Hey, John, is your camera better? Is your camera better? Um, I closed out of a few things. Can you guys hear me better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Gallo has a question. He says, uh, was there a ship store aboard that sold sundries, souvenirs, and stuff like that? Yes. Um, up until about Titanic's time, uh, things like that were, were handled by the ship's barber. First class barber, second class barber. Um, it consisted of things you might have forgotten, like a, a button stud or toothbrush or um, a collar clip. Uh, but it also carried <coughs> more souvenir -y ideas, souvenir like things, like um, oh, a pennant or an ashtray or a bridge counter or something like that. Um, the Germans right at this time really had keyed into the modern era because they were starting to in galleries, shopping galleries on board their ship, ships, their major ones, where you could go to a book stall and buy books, or you could go to a flower stall and buy flowers, or you could get uh, requisites, or you could get souvenirs. 
Uh, the British did not catch on to this until the 20s. Uh, and then you finally see actual shopping centers on the Queen Mary where you might have um, an Austin Reed shop, which is an established gentleman's shop in London, a name shop. Okay. Um, but we did raise a question, Joanna, by Brianna Tucker. Okay. Uh, she, she says here, I've seen so many different patterns of China associated with the first class on Titanic. Could you speak to the Coblate blue pieces or those associated with the uh, Cafe uh, Parisian? I will, and they come up after the, the a la restaurant because the restaurant is fundamental to those other rooms. Those are satellite rooms, and they are essentially served by the a la carte restaurant. Um, my friend John Barris from Australia said, um, asked if there were any cookie jars on the Titanic. And he's doing this kind of to tease me because I probably have the tackiest cookie jar on the planet. It was made in 1997 by Ensco, and it's like about, I don't know, two and a half feet long, and it's shaped like the Titanic, and it's broken in the wrong place. But um, Bill, a while ago, I did message you because I had a cookie jar that was that um, painted in like something similar to um, the second class China pattern. Um, and we, we kind of messaged back and forth about it because um, a lot of companies, or I'll say some companies make kind of like um, their own version of Titanic stuff in their own, do you know what I'm saying? They make- Yes. Their own version of things. Right. I, I actually happen to have one of those, mm -hmm. those jars. I, I actually love it. There's no basis I do too. <laughs> for that particular body shape. Uh, but it's done on the si style of a Chinese ginger jar. And it, it fills a mantle up very well. And that's basically where mine is sitting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a, a lot of China, a lot of reproduction China is made some of it is uh, a realistic, realistically based on historical pieces, and some of them are just pure fantasy pieces. And you know, you you, you take them as they come. Um, but you don't you don't suspect they had anything like that? No cookie jars, no, no. like little cute no. teapots, no. no little. Yeah, it, it's basically made for no. those of us who love Titanic and love the patterns of the china and you know we just like to have cute little fancy things around our house i love right. mine yeah. it's pretty it it looks nice on my shelf with my titanic books okay. and my really ugly two and a half foot long titanic cookie jar okay let's let's get <laughs> back to the presentation because yes let's there's do a that. lot of other stuff um, and when we have another break, um, we'll um, get to some questions from our friend um, Jorge Martinez. Um, he has a couple of good questions, but I think that'll be that'll they'll fit in good after this next section that we go to. Thanks, Bill. Um, before we get into the dining room versus the restaurant China, I want to discuss the difference between a restaurant and a dining room because we've lost the distinction today. But in 1912, it was a big deal. And the place to be seen was the, was the uh, restaurant. And that's one of the reasons why White Star was able to charge a premium where we would start to wonder, well, what exactly is the difference? Now, a dining room is what you would find on most ships up to this point. And the service is patterned after a meal in a private house. The service itself is called table d'hote. That's French for the host's table. Uh, you have appointed seats. For instance, if you're going over to uh, Lord Crumpet's house for dinner, you would be given cards, who you would escort into dinner, where you would be seated, things like that. Very, uh, very regulated. Um, Titan same way. Uh, you had a little bit of wiggle room, but generally speaking, you were expected to stay in the 
chair at the table uh, that you selected. The meal times are fixed. When the dinner bell rings, it's time to go. Showing up late is a problem because the meals are all in sequence. Um, and if you, you show up at a course, there's a problem. You're going straight into the middle of the meal and you've missed everything in front of it. The other thing about dining in a dining room is the menu is relatively short and it's fixed. It's not absolutely rigid like it would be at a private dinner, but uh, generally speaking, you would get a choice of uh, a broth soup or cream soup and maybe a choice of meat. But a lot of stuff was presented. By the way, one last thing. You didn't have to eat it if you didn't want to. You simply made a gesture when the waiter came over and he would be attuned to the fact that you had asked to pass on a particular course. And if it were wine, two passes indicated that uh, no wine was expected with the meal. Perhaps it was absenteeism or something to that effect. But the point is that the dining room relatively controlled. Now in a restaurant, it's quite different. First of all, you have Russian service, table service, in which things are brought out sequentially, starting with uh, soup usually and ending with nuts. Uh, the seating is open. You get to pick your chair. You get to pick your table mates. You can come in anytime you like, although on Titanic, there was always a strong suggestion that you contacted the staff and say that you would be arriving at 2.15. A lot of these meals are can be complicated and you wanted to be sure that the entire meal's cooking time was coordinated so that the party did not sit for an extended period of time because one member wanted something from the grill. Grilling meats on Titanic took forever, 20, 40 minutes. It was always advised to order them in advance and show up promptly at the time you said you were going to be there. Uh, you had a much wider menu selection because everything was essentially cooked to order. Uh, this was also an era of private parties, and it was not at all unusual for society hostesses to throw a big party and say the first day out or as soon as she arrived on board, asked to communicate with the chef. And by the way, there's only one chef in a restaurant. There's a bunch of cooks, but the chef is the guy in charge. Uh, to consult with him, to construct a menu if you were having a, a birthday uh, meal, for instance, uh, you might show up at the beginning of the voyage and saying, Thursday is my daughter's birthday we're going to have a luncheon party with a birthday cake at, say, 1230. And then invitations would go out with a privately printed menu. But you can see with that extra degree of service, uh, the quality of the food, uh, the standards of table service, decoration, tableware were, were just much higher. I wish I could remember there's a, a per head cost, by the way, for the a la carte restaurant. I think it basically boiled down to a shilling just to sit down. The, uh, the China were seen in and around the, uh, the a la carte rest restaurant was probably the best on board. First of all, we're no longer dealing with earthenware. This is not burnt clay. This is China. And the the standard of decoration is much higher than it is in other parts of the ship. Unfortunately, it suffers from all the problems that you have in the ordinary first class service. These are a selection of things brought up from Titanic and you'll notice that they are bleached white. Uh, anything that has multiple firings 
just not survive. But the good news is that if you play the light bounce game, you can see the original decorations. Uh, here's some garlands around the circumference. And then there are some yellow blocks outside of that. That's the remains of the gold stripe. And you'll notice that it's significantly wider than the other pieces. And then here is the White Star Line's formal incorporation name in monograph. And the guards and the monograph. By the way, it isn't usually mentioned, but there is a silent um, oh. There's a silent language in what's going on here. You'll notice that these, these garlands have a gap at the top. These are the triumphal gar, uh, garlands of the Romans. If you were a general and were parading through the streets of Rome in your chariot on uh, basically a victory lap after a battle, uh, you had a slave behind you that would hold one of these these victory garlands over your head. These garlands pick, uh, show up all over Titanic. It's in the clock, uh, at the honor and glory clock. Um, various pieces of furniture, it's woven into textiles. Everybody in first class spoke the language of classical events. And they would recognize that what this was was a quiet acknowledgement that if you had essentially earned the money to dine in this establishment or to travel on board this ship you had indeed conquered the world just as the ancient romans had this is a beautiful little piece um it's unfortunately been bleached but what i like about it is just the basic shape uh, you'll notice that there are small, um, I don't want to cover it first. Uh, there's small wormholes all over the exterior of this piece. When a conservator gets something, there's always a philosophy in place. How original do you want to turn the clock hands back to? Um, do you want to restore it so that it in essence looks factory new? Some people do that. Some people don't touch it. They just stabilize it and they leave it be. The conservators at RMS Titanic, there have been several, but the general feeling is that you do not return to pristine because you can't, you don't have the facility also, it discounts the tragedy of the sinking. This bowl got to look this way for being underwater for close to 100 years. And to strip these disfigurements off would really, as I say, sort of discount the tragedy uh, that this piece of China was a witness to. And here we see the end of the, dec uh, the decoration on it again. It's the, uh, the laurel wreath and the garlands at the top. Now, fortunately, good science is the kind of science that leaves more questions than it answered. Uh, there's a couple of pieces here that are problematic. This is one of them. There aren't too many of these. There's only about two of them. They're all dinner plates, or they're both dinner plates. And they consist of maroon trim, and in the middle, a white star line monogram. Whose were they? You know, who ate off of these? China does not photo well. And without an ultra detailed inventory, uh, I don't think that we'll ever know. But you can conjure to what it might have been used for. The first thing I would notice is that the color maroon is pretty badly out of date. Uh, 
1912 was no different than today. Certain colors are in for a few years, and then they're replaced by other colors. Maroon probably saw its, its high watermark about the year 1900. And it receded after that. By the 20s, it's been replaced by surgical green. Um, I have a very strong suspicion that this is a third-class China plate from one of the earlier ships, the Baltic, the Adriatic, uh, the Oceanic, maybe second class. Uh, but it's definitely from an earlier era. And it was fairly common, by the way, for um, pieces to be transferred. For instance, towards the end of Queen Mary's career, towards the middle of the career, all the Olympic China, the silverware, the silverware had, uh, was being liquidated and you start seeing Olympic stuff showing up on the Queen Mary. And I'll actually show you a, a picture of an inventory from something that goes back to the maiden voyage of Olympic winding up on the final voyage of the Queen Mary. So this might have been used in third class because honestly, I don't think they cared if the dishes matched or maybe more likely this is from the cruise, uh, the cruise accommodation. And by crew, I mean actually the ratings, not the officers. The officers in the engineering department and the deck department essentially ate off first or second class stuff, tableware. Now, occasionally, um, recovery helps solve problems because the answer to the question isn't in the individual pieces. It's trying to get a, a grasp of the whole uh, China set together. In other words, a statistical analysis. When, um, when they started doing recovery operations on Titanic, they started bringing up these, these white cups and saucers. And there's a lot of them, a lot of them. Um, I think there's about three dozen in the collection. And this was kind of a problem because exactly what is going on? The cups look like they're China, not earthenware. And they do carry a gold band at the top and it's very difficult to see but there is a painted house flag. Here's a saucer with the different features uh, together. Now, the very first impulse I know I had when I saw these pieces is, well, maybe these are from uh, the officer's mess hall because it's a very superior piece of China, but it's not overboard. You know, it's not like the other the first class pieces. But it turns out that there are only three or four patterns in this set. A cup, a saucer. This is called a butter pat. This is where you put butter or nuts or small candies. And I believe there's a side plate, but that I haven't seen that. It's not from Titanic. So sort of an honorary member to the club. The question is, why would you have all this good stuff, but it's only cups and saucers? And then it kind of dawns on you it's from the first class deck service. Anything with gold trim is first class. They're not going to put it on anything else because the lower classes, frankly, just didn't pay for it. It's got painted decoration. The other interesting thing is the cup has a very large capacity. It also has a very wide brim. So maybe this is what you put bouillon in and uh, cookies on the side or biscuits as the side, as the British would call it. There's never been any pieces of dinnerware discovered. And this is what's important. If only two or three of these cups and saucers had been picked up, 
and of course seen in wreck footage. Uh, maybe it is a dining set that we're just not aware of. But the fact of the matter is large amounts of cups and saucers have been covered and the absence of anything else really points to the suggestion that this is a limited set. And we know that Spode had limited productions. In other words, they did not create everything as though it were a dinner set. There might be a luncheon set or a tea set or a lawn set. And this would be the equivalent of a lawn set. Here we see a couple of uh, pictures, uh, some of them from the Queen Mary, uh, some of them are from the Alunia, of sort of how this was used. There was the traditional service of the deck chair, but at 11 o'clock, very frequently, a tea cart would go out. And you'll notice that there's tea and coffee and cocoa. Uh, there are cookies, cakes, pieces of pie, uh, small, small nibbly things. Uh, this usually happened about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning. And I believe it happened again about, about two o'clock, but it depends on the ship. Always popular. Now this is one of those satellite rooms. It's the Parisian, Cafe Parisienne. Uh, I've got to tell you that when these were originally noted, uh, there was a certain amount of question of where they might have been used and when. Uh, I can tell you that since research has been going on hot and heavy in the last 10 years, uh, Daniel Klistener has uncovered photographs of these in use at the table at the Cafe Paris. Olympic. So here's uh, here's a mystery solved. Uh, you'll notice that all the stops have now been pulled out on this. You have a gold rim, uh, a Greek key, double pinstripes, a gold handle, and a gold pinstripe at the base. And here are a few that have been recovered from Titanic. Uh, the good news is the gold tends to be impervious. So it has a fairly good success, a uh, good uh, survival rate. Now this cup and saucer set is the star of the collection. Uh, this is from the Ken Marshall collection. This was given away to one of the major machinery subcontractors, and it's in a presentation box. Uh, so immediately you've established that it was a VIP caliber set. Then the question comes up, was this actually used or was this a special creation to commemorate a moment? For many decades, that's where the question stood. And then pieces were brought up from Titanic, so aha. But the problem is exactly what are they used for? I don't know. I wish I could tell you. Uh, the central problem is the documentation for this is very hard to come by. Um, in the catalog, it's marked as special service. Now, some ships like the Queen Mary royalty was traveling on board, or somebody was eating in one of the deluxe suites. And you could actually eat in your deluxe suite if you wanted to. That uh, sitting room was converted to the dining room. I believe Steve Santini has uh, pointed out that he's found evidence of more than just cups and saucers. The problem is I, I haven't seen it personally. And all I've seen are these cups 
and a plate. And the plate is not a dinner plate. It's a side plate. So that would either be rolls or desserts or cookies. So I, I wish I could give you something that was a little more inclusive. But whatever it was, you really had to be somebody to be eating out of these. Because compared to the other recoveries, we only have what you see here, a couple of pieces. And uh, a lot of them are, are broken. Here's, here's an interesting thing. Um, you'll recognize it as a souvenir plate. This was found in the uh, out in the out in the wild. It wasn't in a trunk or it wasn't by anything. It was just out there in the debris field. And the problem is, what ship was in the middle of this uh, this plate? Because it's generic, and I, yes, that's I think the uh, the first Franconia on the far right. So the question is, is this an Olympic, is this a Titanic plate? Or is it the souvenir from the first half of the voyage? Because there's a lot of stuff down there that are from passengers uh, trip to Europe. The Rochambeau, for instance. There's a fair number of souvenirs from her because one of the, uh, one of the second passengers went over to Europe on a French ship and decided to come back on the Titanic. So the question is, is this Titanic or does this belong to another ship? And the answer is we will never know. Because the image on these plates are frequently a, a wax printing. It's not paint and it's certainly not fired. It's just sort of some sort of waxy print that is applied to the uh, uh, and it scrapes off very, very easily. So uh, we're just going to have to leave that go. Now, I do have a couple of things that are technically not China or silver, but they are interesting. And one of them is Mr. Chamber Pot. Um, these are all over the place. Every cabin had at least two of them. They're very plain. They're massively constructed. Here you can see a gold equator and the uh, the uh, white star line in the middle. Those cabins, they were kept under the sink. This is a second class cabin and you can just barely see it down there in the bottom most compartment. Now, contrary to what you might be thinking, these were probably not used as emergency toilets, as emergency commodes. Although that's certainly why they're there. They probably were sick buckets in case of vomiting. None of them have lids. Domestic ones do. Ships, I've never seen one. This is how you get one of these chamber pots out of the cabin without making a mess. First of all, you take a towel, a hand towel, and you put the top of it over the lid. So what's in the chamber pot stays in the chamber pot. And then you'll notice that there's a tail that runs between your belt line and your thighs. This is just in case the sick jumps out of the pot, it doesn't land on you. And another special guest star appointment by the Jolly Cuspidor. These things are also all over the place down there. What they're useful for very often is secondary landmarks. Very often you might have something that you're trying to note where it is. And on the map, you'll go ahead and put down uh, Cuspidor here, uh, mattress here, headboard here, the triangulation will show you what it is you're looking for. Uh, you'll notice that this comes to a very narrow neck, unlike the earlier cash pot, which did not. 
for obvious reasons, uh, you want this to be as narrow as possible to keep the contents in the cuspidor. Um, in 1912, there was kind of a health crisis that was starting to come to the surface. Uh, there was a lot of problems with the Spanish flu. There's a lot of problems with uh, tuberculosis. Both of them were fatal, not 100%, but they were extremely serious and they were propagated by uh, spittle. And men had gotten into the bad habit of spitting a lot. Uh, sometimes it was to clear their throats and sometimes it was because they were chewing tobacco. And sometimes it was just a, uh, oh, a demonstration, alpha dog thing. Um, and there was a major health campaign to have spittoons everywhere, to use those spittoons and to keep them filled with carbolic acid so that whatever got in there was dead on arrival. Now, I don't know how, how many there are down there, but there's quite a bit. And when you start looking carefully at photographs, you realize any place men congregated, there were several of these. Here's one that is tucked away under a table in the first class uh, smoking room. And if they were spitting in the smoking room, they were spitting everywhere. Here's another one for the second class smoking room. And then here's the Oceanics post office. And you'll notice there's a couple down there at the bottom. You'll also notice I was careful to call these uh, cuspidors and not spittoons, or at least I hope. Uh, maybe I was running on autopilot when I was talking, but catalog their cuspidors. So the Victorians made a distinction between an external funnel and an internal funnel, which is a spittoon. And uh, this is not just the first catalog. I must have looked at a dozen. British, uh, US, Canada, uh, upper class like Herod's, middle class like uh, Sears and Roebuck. And the spittoon cuspidor uh, nomenclature goes straight down the line. So, if you look up my catalog, it'll say spittoon, but it will direct you to Cuspidor. Questions? Second. Hello, everyone. Just that a model Titanic here. Can you see the model? It's yes or no. No. Good documentation that the dome was actually edge lit. There's a gallery of light.